Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our second webinar of the 2022 MIPS cycle. Uh, this one is going to be about upcoming 2022 MIPS deadlines and also a grid submission overview. Uh, my name is Zach Smith. I'm part of the ACR's quality and safety staff, and we're joined today by a guest speaker, uh, Vicki Casey, who comes from Providence Health and Services, Oregon region, and she's also a member of the ACR grid committee, and she's going to give an overview of how she pulls grid data and submits it to the uh, NRDR. So just a couple reminders, this meeting will be recorded, so we'll send a link to all the registrants as well as the slides. So give me a couple days for that and I'll get an email out to everybody with a recording. Uh, through the webinar, if you'll enter any questions you have into the Q&A box, we'll answer those at the end. We should have a few minutes at the end to take some questions. <clears throat> So here's what we're gonna to cover today. We're gonna to start off talking about 2021 MIPS final scores. So if you haven't checked those out already, they're available. We're gonna talk about uh, upcoming deadlines, the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances application, and then just some general changes to the MIPS program and the quality category specifically in 2022. We're gonna go over some of the new QCDR measures we've added, as well as some of the old ones that you might already be familiar with. Then we're going to have a quick data submission overview from Vicki, and then we'll go into our Q&A. So we thought it might be a good idea to start off with just identifying some of the acronyms that we use. Um, so we're going to be talking about the NRDR, that's the National Radiology Data Registry, that's the overall registry that ACR has uh, We've supported that for several years now. It existed before the MIPS program, before PQRS, but now we are using it for the MIPS program as well. MIPS is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. That's a CMS program that's part of the QPP, the Quality Payment Program. And if you're on this call, then that means the physicians at your practice are likely eligible to participate in the MIPS program. We're also gonna talk about the QCDR, that's a registry within the NRDR, which uh, that means Qualified Clinical Data Registry. It just means it's a registry that's been approved by CMS to support the MIPS program, submit MIPS measures, and also use some of our own measures, which we call QCDR measures. And then finally, we'll talk about GRID, which is a registry within the National Radiology Data Registry. That's the General Radiology Improvement Database and that's the main registry that we use for our QCDR measures. So before we go into 2022, I just wanna give a quick reminder about 2021 since this uh, deadline is coming up, but the MIPS final scores for last year were posted around, um, I believe July or August this year. Now, just so you know, CMS did apply an automatic exemption to any MIPS eligible NPIs that did not submit any data for 2021. So if you didn't submit anything last year, you automatically got a neutral adjustment. Uh, there was no negative adjustment. Um, but because of that automatic exemption, that means that the positive adjustments will probably continue to be pretty low um, because the, uh, the negative adjustments essentially pay for the positive adjustments. And last year, there were not a lot of negative adjustments. Another thing that came up is that CMS announced that they would not score anybody on the cost category. I think the same thing happened for 2020, but that just means everybody had the cost category reweighted, uh, most likely reweighted re to the quality category. Now for radiologists, that was probably already the case, but they applied that to all physicians for 2021. So you can look up your final score and your payment adjustment on qpp.cms.gov. Uh, you have to uh, have a username and password for that account. It has to be associated with your tax ID number. But if you have that access, you can go in and check that now. If there is any issue with your final score, you can submit what they call a targeted review request. So that's where you ask CMS to basically review your score, figure out if they made some sort of error in the calculation of it. The deadline for submitting that request is October 21st, so that's not too far off. Just wanted to let people know. Um, now, fortunately, if, uh, like I said earlier, there were not a lot of negative adjustments. So hopefully you don't have any issues with your final score, but uh, if you do, 
make sure to get that in before October 21st. So moving on to 2022, the um, upcoming deadlines, we've got one coming up at the end of next month. So on October 31st, we want all users to have some data uploaded to whichever registries they plan to use. So if you're using the grid registry, you need to have some grid data uploaded, as well as some data for whatever MIPS measures you plan to submit. By the end of January next year, we really want you to have all of your 2022 data submitted or uploaded to us. And also, if possible, have your IAs, your improvement activities selected. Uh, now you do have time between January 31st and the final deadline to correct any sort of errors that you find, make changes to what you're planning to submit, but we really advise you to have that all figured out by March 15th. So if you find any errors with your data, you'll have the whole month of February, a couple weeks of March to address that and also figure out for sure which IAs you want to submit. If you have to do promoting interoperability, get that selected. Try to have that totally finalized by March 15th. Um, the last two weeks of March, because of the deadline to submit, um, our IT team is usually pretty overwhelmed with you know, looking into errors that people are having, troubleshooting, uh, helping everybody get ready. So it's best if you try to get all that reviewed over the month of February. And then again, March 31st, as usual, is the deadline to get all of this data submitted to CMS for the 2022 year. Now, if by any chance you are planning on submitting an extreme and uncontrollable circumstances application, uh, the deadline for that is December 31st of this year. Um, as you know, in the previous few years, uh, CMS has given an automatic exemption to anybody who just doesn't submit. Um, that was due to COVID-19, and they haven't signaled that they're going to do anything like that for 2022. Um, at this point, I think it's very unlikely that they'll give a blanket exemption to all non-submitters. So just keep in mind, if you do plan on uh, applying for an EUC exemption, you want to get that application submitted as soon as possible. That application will allow you to request reweighting on one category or all categories. So whatever you feel like you need to have reweighted, you can submit your request to them and they'll review it. Now, there are a couple areas that are receiving automatic exemptions for non-submission. Um, right now, they have a list of counties in Kentucky that were affected by the uh, storms in July and the flooding and everything. So if you're in one of those counties, uh, look it up and verify, but you um, likely don't have to do anything except not submit in order to get that automatic exemption. Now, I'm assuming they will extend that uh, same thing to some counties in Florida because of the hurricane going on right now, but they haven't specifically announced that yet. I would keep my eyes out over the next month or so to see what they say about that. But if you're not in one of those automatic exemption areas, you do have to apply for the exemption if you want one. So here's what MIPS uh, categories look like for 2022. Um, these weights are pretty much gonna stay the same unless something major changes with MIPS. These were the target weights that they wanted for all four categories from the beginning. So I think they're gonna stay at what we have right now. So that's 30% for quality, 30% for cost, 15% for improvement activities, and then 25 for promoting interoperability. As you probably know, most radiologists are going to have cost and promoting interoperability reweighted, mostly to the quality category, which would give you a weight of 85% for quality and 15 for improvement activities. But um, if you're a small and rural practice, they um, have said they'll be weighting improvement activities more highly uh, and, and giving that a weight of 50% and quality a weight of 50%. So the big thing that's changed for 2022 is the performance threshold has finally increased to uh, an actual mean score based on previous performance years. Now, the uh, legislation of MACRA gave CMS the ability over the first few years to sort of incrementally increase that score. If you remember, in 2017, the performance threshold was only three points. So basically, everybody that submitted anything 
uh, got a score above the threshold. They've incrementally increased that every year, but beginning in 2022, they have to base that score on previous years, either mean or median performance data. So based on the mean of scores from 2017, they're setting that threshold at 75 points, which is a lot higher and uh, it, it means it's gonna be a lot harder to get a positive payment adjustment. At the same time, they have removed bonus points. So you no longer receive bonus points if you submit additional measures. Um, before you could submit additional outcome or high priority measures, they would add points to your quality category. Um, they're not doing that anymore. Um, they are still giving the small and rural practice quality bonus, so that's not affected, but uh, all other bonus points have been removed. Uh, also, several MIPS measures have been removed or capped at seven points because of topped out status. But we do have new QCDR measures that we're offering in 2022 and beyond. Uh, and, and we're thinking that for many practices, QCDR measures may be the only way to actually achieve a positive payment adjustment. And uh, that's what this slide is about. So I'll try to explain my math here really quick. Um, some of you, if you've been on our previous webinars, you might have seen these slides before, but I think it's important to uh, reiterate these changes and the difficulty of getting a positive adjustment this year. So again, the performance threshold is 75 points. If you're a large practice and you're expecting to have PI and cost reweighted to the quality category, that means quality is going to be at 85%. So I did some algebra here and determined that if you're submitting six measures and you're multiplying that by a weight of 85% and then you're adding in 15 points, which you, you assume that you're gonna get full credit for the improvement activities category. If you solve for X here, where X is the score for each measure, it, it shows that you're gonna to wanna to score over seven points per measure in order to reach that 75 points um, performance threshold. So if you only submit measures that are capped at seven points, that'll actually, even if you get um, a score of decile 10 for all of those measures, if they're capped at seven points, that would not give you enough of a high score to, um, to exceed the performance threshold. Now, if you have one measure that's at eight points or nine points, 10 points, that would probably be enough. Uh, if the other measures are at seven points, but if they're all at seven, then you're looking at a probably slight negative adjustment. Now, if you're a small practice, as I mentioned before, uh, they're putting more weight into the improvement activities category now. So that would mean that you only have to score above five points per measure to get a 75 point uh, threshold. So that's not as bad for small and rural practices. Uh, that means even if you're submitting topped out point capped measures, you could still potentially exceed the performance threshold if you're scoring well on all those measures. And so, as I mentioned, there were some measures removed in 2022 that were um, some of them not uh, highly used by radiologists, but if you see these two highlighted ones here, Many radiology practices have been submitting these uh, for the last few years. That's MIPS measure 195, the stenosis measurement in carotid imaging measure, and then 225, which is the reminder system for screening mammograms measure. Uh, a lot of radiologists have been submitting those over the years. They've been point capped for a while, um, but now they're officially removed. And these are the measures that are currently capped at seven points. So again, I've highlighted the ones that most radiologists use. Um, those include 145, that's the exposure time and number of images for fluoroscopy exams. 147 is the nuclear medicine correlation with existing imaging studies measure. And then 360 and 364, those are two of uh, what we call the OPR measures um, related to CT dose. Measure 406 is appropriate follow-up for incidental thyroid nodules. And then 436 is the utilization of dose lowering techniques for CT. So again, these are all measures that a lot of people have been using and they're all capped at seven points. So that means even if you score in decile 10, you are not going to get um, a full 10 points. They'll be capped at seven. 
So that's where the QCDR measures come in. Um, we do have six report turnaround time measures and one DIR measure um, related to CT dose. Then we have six of what we uh, were originally calling the grid 2.0 measures. Maybe we should call them the non turnaround time measures. Those were added in 2020 and um, have been slowly uh, increasing in the number of users over the last couple of years. Those can be reported by grid or by the simplified submission template, which Vicki is going to talk about a little bit later. And then we have nine measures which we license from the MSN Healthcare Solutions QCDR, which can also be reported uh, via the simplified submission method. So again, these QCDR measures are likely going to be the only way that you can get uh, above seven points for, for a lot of measures. So here are the turnaround time measures. Again, these are all benchmarked, so they're eligible for up to 10 points. And these just measure how quickly your reports turned around from uh, time of exam to the time that the report was signed. Um, so there are six of them. That's six separate measures that you can submit to MIPS. And then we've got ACRED 34, the uh, CT dose length product measure. So that requires the dose index registry. Um, but that's also a benchmarked measure that you can use for uh, MIPS submission. And here are the grid 2.0 or non turnaround time measures. That's uh, ACRAD 36 through 42. The ones that we've had a lot of people submitting so far are 36, 37, and 40. Um, so we've got the incidental coronary artery calcification the CTPA for pulmonary embolism exam, and then the uh, use of structured reporting in prostate MRI, that's a PIRADS measure. We've also had some users reporting um, ACRAD 41, that's the quantitative criteria for FDG PET imaging. Not as many as we'd like for that one, but uh, it may be enough to keep the measure in the program for a little longer. And again, these are the new MSN measures, which we've licensed from their registry. Uh, of these, MSN 15 is benchmarked. These are also relatively new measures, so it does take some time to get a benchmark for them. So our grid 2.0 measures don't have a benchmark yet, and most of these MSN measures don't have a benchmark yet either. So now I'll talk a little bit about how you submit the grid turnaround time measures, and Vicki is going to go into more detail on this, but the turnaround time measures, ACRAD 15 through 25, um, use this template, which is the exam level data submission template. And as you can see here, we've got columns that correlate to the data elements required for those measures. So specifically, uh, O through R here are the ones that are relevant for the turnaround time measures. Um, that's the date the exam was completed the time it was completed, the date the final report was signed, and the time the final report was signed. So you populate this template with that information, and then we calculate how many hours it took to turn around the report, and that's what your score is based on for turnaround time. Now, of course, we also need columns J, K, or L, which give us the modality of the exam. And then we have what's called the simplified data submission method, which we use that for the non turnaround time measures, ACRED 36 through 42. Um, this is a method that's more similar to the MIPS template. Um, there's only a couple fields that are slightly different, but if you submit MIPS measures through us, then those will look pretty familiar to you. Um, and so we have created this document here, which when I send these uh, slides out later, you'll be able to click that. It's also available on our QCDR page, but that gives you an overview of the simplified specifications. It links you to the template, all that stuff that you need. And so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Vicki Casey. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing in just a second. And Vicki, you can start. All right. Thank you, Zach. Let me share a screen. Can you see me? Uh, let's see. Might need, yeah, need to give it just fine. a second. And again. There we go. Looks good. Okay. 
So thank you. Um, today, I just wanted to share with you uh, some maybe tips or tricks um, on how we submit our uh, QCDR information. There's a couple or there's two specific formats that I'm going to be sharing. One is uh, relative to the turnaround time. And then the other is a little uh, deeper dive, if you will, into the simplified, uh, which is my personal favorite. So I'm just going to disclose that right up at front. Uh, for format number one, I'm going to refer to that as the grid original. And as um, Zach stated, it must be used for the AC RAD turnaround time measures. However, it can be used for all other or non turnaround ACR RAD measures. Um, and also, key is that is to note is that is accessed through the grid portal. And for no format number two, is the grid sim simplified and it is optional for non it's you you can use it an option or in place of the first uh, for non turnaround time measures 36 through 42 and it is accessed through the MIPS portal looking at the grid format number one turnaround time uh, does satisfy measures 15 through 19 and 25 What's nice about just submitting this is that uh, the requirements um, are minimal and which will facilitate a timely upload. And I personally recommend uh, quarterly uploads um, because if you haven't already accessed, um, I strongly encourage those timely upload or the quarterly uploads because uh, the ACR has provided some interactive reporting. Uh, it's very robust. Um, and usually reporting is available within 24 to 48 hours tops of your upload. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, how that supports improvements a lot earlier. So this is kind of the meat of the grid turnaround time. Um, Zach shared the template. Uh, and so what I've tried to do here is just blow up uh, how the data is sourced. Uh, because there is some interaction between Excel uh, getting data out of your RIS. And um, actually, I'm going to refer to as a, a RIS system, uh, EHR. We here at our organization use uh, EPIC. Um, so basically, I'm able to easily find these fields. So for the file version and facility ID, those are both manual, um, easy cup, uh, copy and paste functions in Excel in the uh, first two columns here. The exam ID is, of course, going to pull from your RIS, as well as uh, some uh, patient information, such as age, sex, the study name, the physician MPI, and the physician local ID. That's going to be your uh, radiology systems um, identifier um, in addition to the MPI. Multiple readers, uh, we do not capture this, therefore uh, we don't report it and it is not required. Moving over to the CPT, so we're kind of in this area here in the blue, CPT codes, um, ICD-10 and modality. It's important to note here is that these are conditional fields. Um, only one of these three have to be reported. Um, so if you have access, easy access to your CPT code, you can pull that. I personally use the modality. Uh, it's just easier because when you report off a of CPT codes, you have to be kind of careful because you might have duplicate rows coming through in your data set. The ICD-10 um, is kind of a scary one because we have to get into our ho hospital billing. Um, uh, information and the RIS and the hospital, uh, those two areas really don't talk to each other. So it really does, it makes reporting rather difficult. So again, I encourage the use of, um, you know, pick one, but if you are using that CPT code, be aware that you may have duplicate line items. Place of service um, that's coming out of your RIS. So the place of service is like your um, ED, inpatient, outpatient identifiers. Breast ultrasounds, um, that is kind of a combo between the pulling the data out of the RIS and then a manual update based off of the procedure um, to identify whether or not it's a breast ultrasound. 
And then of course the date and time of the completed, which we use here uh, as end exam. And that is a electronic timestamp out of EPIC. So when our text uh, final or in, in the exam is not the keyed in, there are actually two uh, stamp, time stamps. One is keyed in and one is on the tech. And so we pull the actual uh, uh, system timestamp and then the timestamp for the final report. All of those will be coming out more than likely of your uh, information system. So with that, uh, going to move over to the grid simplified format. And the why I personally um, like it is because it totally use, eases my uh, experience by reducing the number of fields to report. And, you know, I, I over time, um, you know, data is, can be difficult to extract. And we do not have robust extraction tools here and not a whole lot of um, IT support. So the access to data is fairly limited. So if you find yourself in that situation, um, I think you'll also appreciate the uh, simplified format. And then of course, um, and then this link here is the actual link to the um, ACR's simplified measure specifications. So what you need to be looking for um, in your reports to satisfy the numerator and denominators. So looking at those key fields that are required pretty much across um, all of the measures, ACRAD 36 through 42, uh, here is the uh, looking up top here, and then again, uh, pulling it out or blowing it up a little bit down here. Uh, this is the actual um, requirements uh, for the grid upload. I actually also pull in the final report into a text format to help support um, the, the audit. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so again, columns A through actually the, the doo -doo -doo -doo. this is correct, A through K are required for the upload. Column L is just the uh, final report. But looking closely here at the fields that are required in that same uh, format of trying to figure out where it's sourced, the exam date and time, of course, is coming from your uh, RIS of the Physician 10, you would have to manually populate. Uh, MPI is coming from RIS, patient ID, could be the MRN or any other patient identifier, again, from your RIS. The measure number is just a quick co copy and paste um, in Excel. The CPT code is coming from the RIS. And actually, the secondary, these two, uh, Zach, I might, yes, we do have secondary denominator info. I personally don't use a measure that use that, but it would be manual. Uh, the numerator response value is the one that I tend to focus on the most. Um, which is um, we're going to talk about in a moment, and then the exam session number, and then the final report again. Final report is not uploaded to the ACR, but you need it for your um, audit. So with that, I'm going to hopefully gracefully move over to Excel. Am I good to go, Zach? Can you see Excel That's here? good, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. So this is essentially the template um, and I probably need to blow it up just a little bit. I tried to color code here. Um, I'm trying not to make uh, this too complicated. It's really not complicated, um, but I tend to make things complicated. So I apologize uh, forward. So the exam date, we talked about that. The RAD 10 would be manual. Uh, so all of these fields here, again, are coming from your uh, RIS. This is a manual, just cut and paste down. 
CPT codes coming from your RIS, the accession number. So this is actually all that's needed for that simplified template. These, however, I also pull out, however, they do not get uploaded. So you could just, after you're done with your audit um, and ensuring that your uh, uh, numerator is correct, then you can just get rid of, or just either save another file or um, just delete it off. Personally, I create a second file. I have like a prep file and then I have my actual upload file. So we, in here, I pull in the order ID, which is different than the session number. It's just in the way um, in the uh, Epic that I search on things. The final provider, uh, finalizing provider. And this I pull in because I like to see their names because I don't really recognize their MPIs all the time or easily. The procedure name and procedure code and the actual location where the exam was performed. And then I do some extraction here for the month and the year, uh, just converting the uh, exam date and time into these fields because it just helps ease and keeps me on track. But really what's probably the most important out of all of this is the search function. Over here in these columns off, um, we talked about having the radiologist report. I've hidden it uh, for purposes of PHI. However, um, if those columns were displaying the search function here, all you have to do in Excel is put in you know, the keyword that you want to search and the columns that you want to search it through. So if the radiologist report you know, doesn't quite fit all into one field, it can spill over into other columns. So you just have to, um, you know, include those columns. And then essentially say, okay, if it's, if this um, PIRADS with a hyphen is in column U or in the radiologist report that's in column U, then give me a one, if not, give me a zero. And the reason for this is because we do not have, um, all our radiologists, um, uh, macros, if you will, the same. We're working, and this is actually where we get into some improvement. Um, but it's important, uh, you have to be very literal in your search strings, but once you've done this one time, um, really for one measure, it gets a whole lot easier. It's just really that first initial setup that might seem kind of painful or take, you know, um, 30 minutes or so to set up. Uh, but after that, it's really quite easy. And then you're able to identify which one of your physicians that might need um, some coaching on their, um, on the report or help set up their report or their macros. I will, ad again, uh, Admit the PIRADS is actually a very easy one uh, to set up. And actually, if you're not reporting on it, I encourage you to try it out um, because it's, it's an easy measure to get this information and set up in Excel and get it uploaded. The a little bit more complicated is the uh, FDG PET, the RAD, AC RAD 41. And again, this template um, is the same simplified template. So all that information is the same. And then we move over here to all this information is gonna be the same. What changes is of course, all of these columns here, because there's four elements um, that are required for the FDG PET. And each one of these columns uh, is uh, a search, if you will. So it's searching again over here off of the radiologist report and will return a value. Now, again, I think the one of the elements for the ACR RAD requires um, three different uh, elements. So I have to make sure that those are in the radiologist report, right? Without having to read every single report. Um, and if it comes back, less than a particular number that I'm looking for off of that search string, um, it will be my targeted report um, to audit. And again, that's uh, true with each one of the elements. 
But those search functions, again, very easy to set up um, in Excel, because really all you're doing is looking for a keyword. And then, you know, hopefully, again, if you're if you um, have struggle or you're struggling with trying, you know, your radiologists are all over the board with the um, the um, with um, keywords, um, or in other words, there's not a standard structured report. You can work with your groups and um, get that implemented. And the key benefit there, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here, is really your is I shouldn't say benefit, but it is your um, opportunity for improvement. So we talked about the auto, auto population of manual fields, the keyword search, and adding the numerator code. And just one last little hint here, um, can tell you how many times I've had to, you know, just Google search on that Excel search function because, you know, there's quotes and commas and whatnot. It's like, check the order out. But uh, once you find your, your favorite site uh, for that formula, just uh, star it and favorite it, and you can, it will be readily available when you need it. And then to wrap up, to talk about our, uh, improvement opportunities, again, standardizing those final uh, reports and thinking back to, you know, the purpose of these measures um, is really for that quantitative and qualitative um, information for the ordering providers. And then with the grid turnaround time, you know, uh, key opportunities there, um, especially if you're using those interactive reports, uh, those reports definitely uh, drill down um, with super ease, uh, facility, a physician, location, timeframes, um, time of day, and then they can also be exported. And I find, and I've actually used them um, for presentations to our administration, senior administration, and quality councils. So with that, Zach, that's all I have. I'm going to turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Vicki. I really appreciate you joining us today to uh, share your expertise. Um, that's something we get a lot of questions about, so I was happy to be able to have one of our actual grid users come on here and talk about how, how she manages her data. Um, it's something we don't get a lot of opportunities on our end at ACR to see exactly how people are pulling all this data. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for doing that for us, Vicki. So for these next few slides, I just want to quickly go over the data submission process, how you review your performance reports in the uh, MIPS portal after you've uh, started uploading data. So after you've submitted grid measures or MIPS data, um, what you do from there. So first, if you're submitting MIPS measures or the simplified grid templates, you're going to want to start off by going to the MIPS participation portal. So to get there, you have to be logged into your regular nrdr.acr.org account. Um, and then you click MIPS participation portal under your registries. From there, you click on this link to data collection and reports. Then you'll see something like this with these links along the top. So the first place you'll go is the upload data tab. That's where you submit that MIPS template or the simplified grid template. Um, and then you can also see the performance report link is up here as well. So you do want to make sure that your MIPS files or your simplified grid files are accepted. So we recommend looking over the file specifications, whether you're submitting via Excel file or the text file. Uh, these specification documents here tell you exactly how to format every single data element to make sure that our system accepts it. So, you know, how to format the date and time, um, you know, th those are really the main, uh, the main issues that people run into. Also, how to name your file when you upload it to us. So some common errors are the file name might be invalid. Um, one of the physicians might not be listed in your account, or if they are, they might not be enrolled in MIPS. There could be an invalid 10, so that would happen if you haven't connected your tax ID number to the MIPS registry yet. 
or possibly just some missing data fields. Uh, you can look at the, the measure specifications for those um, to find out exactly what data fields you need to be submitting. Some measures require an ICD-10 code. Um, some measures, their numerator codes change over the years. So you wanna make sure you're using the most up-to-date codes as well. So uh, if you see that a file has been rejected um, or it just has some rejected records or some records that are successful with warning, what you'll wanna do is check your log file, which will show you exactly what the errors were and let you know how to fix them. So this is what you see when you're looking at your upload data file list. So you can see here a list of all the files submitted, the date they were submitted to us, and then their status, whether they were fully successful, whether there were some rejections, whether they were successful with warning. Um, so just look in those columns there and uh, you can see how many records had an issue versus how many were successful. Um, under the action column here, if you click that button, that's where you find the drop down to download your log file. So if you do have rejections, take a look at that and that'll tell you exactly what the problems were. Now, of course, once you've started uploading data, you're gonna to wanna to look at your performance report. Now, this is available throughout the year. So if you've already been submitting your MIPS and QCDR measures for 2022, then you'll be able to see those measures here in your performance report. And it gives you a score breakdown both at the group level. So if you're submitting as a group, you can see how your whole group is doing, or it'll give you a breakdown by individual physician if you're planning to submit on the individual level. And even if you're planning to submit as a group, it can be useful to look at what the individual physician scores are, because as Vicki was showing, you know, it's, it's helpful to look and see if maybe a couple of physicians are scoring lower than the others, if, if you, know, you need some guidance on how to improve the score of a measure, uh, you can start by looking at that. Um, you will see how your scores compare against the historical CMS benchmark. So you'll see what decile you fall under and that'll tell you how many points you're gonna get for the measure when you submit it. And this uh, doesn't update instantaneously, but it does update within about 24 hours of you submitting data. So it's almost a live view of how you're scoring based on the data that you've submitted. You just have to give it a few hours to update and uh, then you can check it out. So that pretty much wraps up our um, portion about measure submission and all that. I just wanted to quickly remind everybody, um, some of you may have already gotten a notice about the audit. Um, we just started that last month, so there will be more audit invitations going out soon. But this is something that CMS requires us to do as a QCDR. All QCDRs have to do this. And essentially, we take a random selection of TINs and NPIs um, from the uh, QCDR and we audit their quality measures and their improvement activities and promoting interoperability measures if applicable. Used to, we only had to audit the quality measures, but uh, in recent years, CMS has expanded that requirement to improvement activities and um, PI as well. So if we have contacted you uh, right now, we're just contacting you for quality measures, but we will be following up about uh, improvement activities early next year. We know that most people don't have their IAs selected just yet, so we do give you a little bit of time, but don't be surprised if you get a follow-up email about that. So when we verify the quality measures, what we do is we look at your patient reports and we verify that the denominator was reported accurately and that your numerator performance was reported accurately. So if you say that you met performance, we make sure you met it. Uh, if you say you didn't meet performance, we make sure you didn't meet it. Now for the improvement activities, the um, data validation is a little bit different because every improvement activity is different, but CMS has created this data validation criteria guide, which will tell you exactly what you need to provide in the event that you're audited for these improvement activities or PI measures. So again, the audit began in August and will continue through the rest of the year and the first uh, month of next year. So um, be on the lookout if, um, uh, if, if you're requested to participate in the audit, uh, please try to respond to us. If you have any questions about it, let us know and we're happy to help out. So as always, if you'd, not, if you'd like to contact us, you can submit a ticket using the NRDR support link. Uh, you can also use that link to look at our articles 
which cover um, all sorts of different areas within the NRDR. It, it covers every single registry, how to submit data um, for grid. It covers all the different ways that you can submit data. Um, we've got lots of information about MIPS and everything in there too. Uh, you can also email us at nrdrsupport at acr.org uh, or just give us a call at our line here. And uh, a good place to look if you just need some general QCDR information, if you're looking for the measure specifications, for the uh, Excel template, anything like that, you can find all that on acr.org slash QCDR. So um, take a look at that page if you're in need of any of our resources. So I think we can move on to our Q&A. Um, it's only Vicki and I here um, answering questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have uh, Judy Burleson join us today. So I'm hoping that we can answer all of your questions, but we might have to uh, ask you to send us an email um, if we're not able to answer them. So we uh, first got a question from Danica. Um, Danica was asking for turnaround time reporting, can we report preliminary result times or do we need the final result? Um, because this may change the reporting time significantly. So I might ask Vicki to weigh in on that. Uh, I would assume that what we want is the actual final report. So, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what a preliminary report might include, but uh, I, I think what we would want would be the, the final report. Does that make, make sense to you, Vicki? It does. Um, and given the reason, I uh, uh, totally hear you, Annika, that it changes the time significantly. Uh, but not all prelim preliminary reports um, are just that it's their final. I read the rules that they're a final report. Thanks. And actually, Lou from our uh, grid registry team, he confirmed that too. So final report. Um, Danica also asks, would we be able to send Vicky's Excel template with the slides? Um, she's saying that the formulas and keyword searches would be helpful. Um, I, I think we can do that. Yeah, if you're okay with that, Vicky, I could include that when I send the slides out. Sure. So uh, we have a question here from Nicole, and Nicole is saying that um, she inquired if separate TINs can be entered for submission via NRDR. Um, she had been told, yes, you would be able to upload data for multiple TINs. In follow-up, we discovered there is not a TIN field in the GRID 2.0 template, but there is a facility ID field and a physician local ID field but we don't believe these are the correct fields. Uh, could you let us know how we would enter the two separate TINs? Could we use the simplified submission for ACRED 17 and ACRED 40? So uh, yeah, it sounds like um, you're talking about the, the um, original grid template that Vicki and I showed. Um, you're correct, that does not have a TIN field. So uh, the only place that you submit TIN data is through the MIPS portal. So Yes, you would submit your um, ACRED 40 through simplified submission if that's easiest for you. You um, cannot submit the turnaround time measures using that though. Um, the uh, grid, the, sorry, the standard grid template that you use for the turnaround times, um, it, it uh, I'm trying to think how to explain this, but we don't ask for the TIN in that spreadsheet because your grid account is associated with a TIN. So uh, the measures you submit will be applied to your TIN, but um, we don't collect the TIN in that, in that uh, template. Sorry if that's confusing. I, I understand where the confusion comes, comes from because you can submit multiple TINs data using the MIPS template or the standard uh, or the simplified template. Uh, we also got a question from someone, uh, will we find out this year if any of the QCDR measures from 2021 were benchmarked? So, so far they have released the 2022 benchmarks. 
Um, and it doesn't look like they added any new benchmarks for the QCDR measures. So right now it's looking like it's still uh, the turnaround time measures, ACRAD 34 and um, MSN 15. I think it's possible that they could update those benchmarks later in the year, um, but they might not reflect 2021 submission until 2023. So we'll, we'll have to see about that. But um, yeah, hopefully at least 36, 37, and 40 will get a benchmark. Um, but right now they, they have not been given one. Uh, we did have a hand raised from Nicole. Let me see. Nicole, I can unmute you if you'd like to ask some more, uh, something more specific about the 10 question that you had. So I'm going to unmute you right now. Okay, you should be good. Zach, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Nicole. Okay, hi. Um, yes, yeah, so then should we submit everything through the MIPS portal? Is that what you're saying? Because the issue is we have two TINs and one of them is specifically for MRI. And you know, with MRI, it's hard to get any points, especially since the threshold has um, raised. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're trying to get some points on the MRI side. So what would be the best way for the ones that qualify for MRI for us to be able to submit for those? So I, I think maybe the best option would be to have that set up as a, just a totally separate facility because then you could associate that facility with its tax ID number. And- What do you mean by a separate facility? Because we do have two different TINs for the MRI side. So that's why we're trying to split the TINs. Sure, so I mean, within the NRDR portal, um, having the two TINs, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe we should take this to email because um, yeah, well, I, I might need to get you to our, uh, our registration team to kind of discuss that. Yeah, because I opened up a ticket and it's been a month since I received a response. So that's why now I'm bringing it up since we are talking sure. about submissions. So I have been waiting a while for a response. Yeah, could you send me an email, Nicole? You've got my email address, right? I'm yeah. Smith at acr yeah, Yes, and we'll... I, I sent it to you on um, September 1st, but I'll resend it. Okay, please, yes. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, another person is asking, can we skip the upload on October 31st and just upload by January 31st? We would prefer that you at least have uploaded something by October 31st. It doesn't have to be the full year of data, but um, just to make sure everything is still functioning. I, I understand if, if you've done this every year for the last couple of years, um, you probably, everything's probably going to go fine, but if you could just get some data uploaded, that would be excellent. Um, Tamara Hicks is asking, do IA activities have to be submitted through NRDR or can they be uh, submitted on the QPP site? And that's correct. You can submit those on the QPP site. So you don't have to submit them through us. If you don't submit them through us, you'll probably get email reminders uh, just because we'll see that you haven't submitted them. So we'll, we'll just be checking to make sure you're not planning to submit them, but that is totally fine if you'd want to submit them through QPP. Uh, that also means that we won't audit them <laughs> if you submit them through QPP. Um, but yeah, wh whatever you prefer, whatever is easiest for you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Noel Polenka uh, about ACRI 34. Can we see our ACRI 34 performance year to date in near dear? And the answer is yes. You can definitely see that in the performance report. It'll show up on there. Um, so yeah, if you if you go into your MIPS portal and look at your uh, TIN under the performance report, you should see ACRAD 34 there. If you don't see it, it may be that um, maybe the tax ID number isn't associated with GRID, and that's something that you can just fix on the uh, on the near dear account side of things. Uh, Wayne is asking, have any new measures been approved for 2023 in the QCDR? So um, right now, nothing 
has been officially approved for 2023. We didn't submit any new measures. So it's the same uh, QCDR measures we currently have and the same MSN measures. There weren't any new ones this year to be submitted. Uh, we assume that the same ones will be available for 2023, but we really don't know for sure until we've gotten the official word from CMS. And sometimes, unfortunately, that doesn't really happen until December. So it'll be a while before we know for sure what the 2023 QCDR measures are. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, we have a question from Jody. Uh, there is a cost difference between members and non-members. What is the cost of an annual membership? Um, I don't know for sure. I, I think that it's roughly um, it's roughly the same amount that you would be paying in the difference um, for uh, the MIPS portal. So roughly $1,000, I believe, but I think that also depends on um, the type of physician, uh, things like that. So if you'd like, I can put you in touch with our membership team. Uh, you can send us an email if you have questions about that and they'll let you know for sure. But um, it's roughly comparable to what you'd be paying extra for the MIPS portal. Um, we have another question here. I noticed a lot of the MSN measures are not scoring properly in the performance report section. Is that being worked on? Uh, some of the exclusion codes are counting as it doesn't meet code. We have noticed some issues with that. Um, I've been working with the IT team to get some of that sorted out. Uh, if, if there's one in particular that you've noticed, I know that I have a ticket open from somebody that found that same issue. So if um, you're, you're listed as anonymous here, but if you have a ticket open with me, we are working on that. But if you haven't emailed us about it, please reach out to me and let me know specifically which ones you noticed weren't working correctly. Because, um, yeah, we did have that issue with one of the measures and we fixed it um, fairly recently. Um, but there may be others that we haven't caught yet. So please let us know. So right now that takes us to the end of our questions. So I'll give it just a little bit longer, see if anybody else has something. And if not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. But um, if you do have questions for us, again, reach out to us here. And then my email address is zsmith at acr.org if you wanna reach out to me directly. Um, we're happy to look into any issues that you're having. And uh, not seeing any new Q and A's. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. I just wanna say thanks again, Vicki, for your time today. Really appreciate you putting a presentation together for this. Um, and uh, yeah, we will be sending a recording out to everybody. So be looking out for that a recording and the slides and everything. So be on the lookout in the next few days. All right, I hope everybody has a great day and thanks a lot for joining us.